Cal Sanders had a good marriage with Connie and a dream job with his old friend Tony Lapiro. Then one day Tony started a new relationship with a married woman and made sure to relate to Cal all the particulars except the name of her lover. Cal finally figured out that Madame X was his loving wife. I finally collapsed and must have passed out. I know it didn't feel like sleep when I woke as I certainly wasn't refreshed in any way. My mouth tasted like bile. I was shivering from lying in the dewy grass without a jacket on. My clothes were soaked from the dew. My eyes were crusted shut from all the tears I had shed. Once I rubbed the grit out, they were dry and itchy. Maybe I would have an allergic reaction to something and I would die, choking as my throat swelled shut. Nah, I couldn't get that lucky. I finally looked around to get my bearings. I certainly wasn't in a cave or Superman's fortress of solitude. I was in a pivot corner on a farm. For those who don't know what that is, it is the area where the pivot irrigation system can't get into the corner. Farmers sometimes plant cover crops there but this farmer had let it go back to prairie and the native grass was about two foot tall and thick and very wet from the dew. I realized I was only about a mile from my condo as the condo was near the edge of town in a new development. I know I ran for miles but, since I wasn't trying to run in a straight line, had slowly veered to my left and had almost ran a circle. What luck to have run away and almost ran home again. I wonder what Freud would have made of that. A car came down the paved county road that edged the field so I ducked down in the tall grass again. I have no idea who it was in the car but somehow I got the feeling that the two lovers would be out trying to find me. It suddenly gelled in my mind why the partnership contract was so onerous. Tony thought that she was calling all the shots. If I tried to buck her in any way, work slow down, go public, divorce Connie, out them, or any other thing I might try to do she would destroy me and my career. At least she thinks so. She should have waited until her lawyer went through the agreement. Now what? What is my next step? I felt in my pocket and found my wallet and my cell phone. The battery was dead so I had no idea how many missed calls and texts I might have. I also believe that with a dead battery the phone can't be tracked even by the police. I guess I didn't need to charge the phone for a while. I sat in the grass so my head would be the only thing visible from the road. As it was a Monday the traffic was fairly heavy with commuters headed to jobs in town. Sitting there wasn't helping my clothes dry so I waited until the morning rush was over and then made my way to the road ditch. I proceeded back towards town facing traffic so I could get off the narrow shoulder when a car approached. I certainly didn't want to be hit. It would be my luck to survive but be badly injured and not able to escape the twosome. As I walked I tried to figure out how to make them pay for their treachery. Should I get a gun and shoot them both in the groin? Nope, fast way to jail. Should I get to my car and run them down when they come out of a restaurant? Nope, again that was a fast way to jail. I toyed with multiple ways to exact revenge without figuring a way to stay out of jail. And it was complicated by the fact that Tony was the one who schmoozed with the local rich and famous to build the business. I was just the designer and I figured I had little or no political clout. Should I divorce Connie? I mentally debated doing that. If I file on her I would have to pay for all the attorney's fees, both hers and mine. That was a common complaint from friends whose marriages had cratered. The one who files pays the freight. A couple of friends, both male and female, had been financially and emotionally broken when the spouse had fought the divorce tooth and nail. No, why give her what she wants? She would then have most of our assets and be free to marry Tony. That would be what Tony would want also. Why else had she pursued my wife but to take her away from me? Deep in thought I almost didn't hear the tires on the road and almost got slammed by the mirrors on a huge pickup as it went by. Only the horn honk made me look up in time to step aside and almost fall into the ditch. I needed to keep my head in the game here. That mile back to the condo didn't take long enough to make decisions. I was still debating my near and far future in my mind as I came to the corner down the street from my former home. I stopped and peeked around the near building. Thankfully I saw only my car sitting in front of the once happy home but was now just a hollow building. Now how to approach this? I wanted some clothes and my toiletries. Well, maybe not my razor. I had no need to maintain my clean-shaven visage now. 
maybe a goatee would look good. I smiled at the mental image of mutton chops on my narrow face. Hey, maybe I still had a sense of humor. Eschewing the sidewalk I quickly made my way straight down the front of the townhomes to my car. I quickly unlocked it and started up and moved it to where it could not be blocked. Then I went back to the condo for some of my personal belongings. The place was devoid of life, thankfully. There was a note propped on the table but I ignored it. I grabbed my duffel bags instead of a suitcase. Duffel bags are a lot easier to maneuver if I needed to make a hasty withdrawal. Soon I had everything I needed for a few days. Unless she changed the locks I could get in whenever I needed to get more of my clothes. I had my camera and my laptop with the appropriate chargers in their bags. It took a couple of trips out to the car. I took my stuff in order of importance so if disturbed I could make that hasty withdrawal. I didn't take or want any of the photos. I looked at the various drawings and then went to check the nude oil I had done of Connie. It was missing. What a surprise. I suppose it was now prominently displayed in Tony's home. It hardened my heart some more. Time to leave. I headed to the local branch of our bank where I made quick work of setting up a new account and having half of our savings and checking deposited there. That would give me some breathing room. Next was a stop at Walmart for a track phone. After activating it I called Jerry Caldwell, my attorney, and brought him up to speed. We now knew why the partnership was offered and why it was so onerous. Jerry wanted to know if I was going straight for a divorce and confirmed what I believed would happen. I decided to just be a ghost for a while until I could figure out what I really wanted to do. I know that at age 33 I was far from being over the hill so there was the distinct possibility I might want a wife again if I could get over the fear of rejection and humiliation. He had me come by the office and I signed a power of attorney form for medical and financial matters. Connie had no say in what might become of me in case I was incapacitated somehow. I could even keep her from seeing me if I ended up in a hospital for any reason. That caused me to have a little less anxiety as I didn't want to see her in the near future and maybe forever. Back in my car I put my old phone on the charger I kept in there at all times. I needed to do one more thing before becoming a ghost. After stopping for something to eat at one of the fast food joints, I powered up the phone and waited for the texts and missed phone calls to quit dinging their notifications before sending my own text. It was to my boss, Tony Lapiro. Short and simple, I resign effective immediately. Send my final check with my leftover vacation and sick leave to Constance. Do not try to contact me. This phone will be deactivated as soon as possible. To my wife was another short and simple text. You may contact me through my attorney, Jerry Caldwell. He has my power of attorney in the event you need or wish to dispose of the condo. I have moved half of our checking and savings to a separate account. After hitting send I took the battery out of the phone and threw the whole thing in the nearest trash can. I then called my phone service provider and cancelled that phone. That should save Constance some money each month. Now, where do I go? There were still some clothes and other objects at the condo but I finally decided they were just things. I could replace anything and probably live without all of it. I needed a job and a place to hang my hat, even though I don't wear one very often. Renting a motel room, at least in a decent motel, was out as they would demand a credit card. I could be tracked by Constance, if she so desired, and that would lead to something I was not yet prepared to do, a confrontation. I was still that wounded animal searching for that spot to lick my wounds. I knew that I shouldn't try for a job as a graphic designer, at least locally. Should I hang my shingle and become a one-man shop? Maybe later, now I just needed something to occupy me and provide some cash to live on. I didn't want to waste fuel just driving around so I went to the county park on the river about three miles outside of town. There I could park under a tree and use the shade as I contemplated my next move. I still wanted to hurt Tony somehow but couldn't figure out how at the moment. Late in the afternoon I finally decided to call Jennifer White at the office. When I got connected to her I went straight to the point. Jen, this is Cal Sanders. I just wanted you to know that I resigned this morning. Tony has done something so vile to me that I cannot remain there. No matter what she says about me leaving it is only because she seduced my wife and wants her for herself. 
I will miss all of you in the job but, like I said, I cannot stay there. Jennifer was quick to reply, Cal, I am so sorry. I didn't recognize the number that you called FR. OM shall I keep it a secret? Yes, please. I have done away with my old phone and will never use that number again. I am also leaving town as soon as I decide on a destination. I will not probably call again. Well, let me fill you in. After Tony must have received your resignation she kind of went crazy. She ranted and yelled for quite a while before finally calling a meeting. She said you were taking a short leave of absence and she would be getting you back to work as soon as she got to her attorney. I don't know what she meant by that. I just know that without your input nothing seems to be getting done today. I know you are all good at your jobs. You will do fine without me. I had to get off the phone with Jennifer as Jerry was trying to get hold of me. Cal, it is starting already. Ms. Lapiro's attorney just contacted me. He is demanding that you return to work immediately or the contract penalties will be enforced to the fullest extent. I have to say I almost burst out laughing when he called. I don't know if he is incompetent or just not paying attention. I told him that he needed to reread the partnership agreement. I thought he was going to have a stroke because I wasn't agreeing to send you back to Zapiro Tooth Suite. He went on while I chuckled. My grief over the loss of my marriage wasn't keeping me from seeing the humor in what was going on. Also, a Constance Reynolds Sanders has also contacted me. She wants some messages forwarded to you. Are you ready for them? No, I have nothing to say to her and don't need her platitudes. It is all still too raw. I will put all of them in your file. When you are ready to read them I will send them to you or email them if that is what you prefer. I agreed and he rang off stating he would contact me again after hearing from either Tony or her attorney. He was still chuckling as he anticipated some fireworks. I got out and strolled on the river bank. Where it dipped down to the water I stopped and just watched. Small twigs were floating by. Small water bugs zipped across the more placid areas where the water slowly swirled next to the bank. I tossed a couple of small branches out into the stream. Near the center of the river the water moved faster than near the edge. I sat down and pondered how that was. I really didn't care why I was just trying to keep from thinking and remembering. I had thought that Connie was going to be my partner in life and for life. We had grown so close over the years. I had hoped we would become like my grandparents, so close no one even thought of one without automatically thinking of the other. Complete harmony at the end of their lives had them happy and content to the very end. I don't know how long it took to get to that state of being but it was the only way I ever knew them. Now, I find that I never knew her at all. She could and did betray me without any seeming guilt at all. She was having sex with me as well as sneaking around with Tony for lesbian love as much as possible. If she had come to me in the beginning and told me she was contemplating a sexual relationship with a woman I might have just accommodated her desires. No, it was the sneaking around in Tony's blatant conversations where she enticed me with her affair. Both showed the utmost in disrespect to me. I needed to do something, anything before I let this whole situation overwhelm me. But where to go and what to do? I finally had a rational thought. Why not do something so different it would be even harder to track me down? I did a quick search and found the number for Bell Derry and made the call to Nancy. Hello, Nancy, this is Cal Sanders from Zapiro. How are you today? We exchanged pleasantries and then I got down to business. I am looking to broaden my horizons a little. Would you have a job opening for a city boy who wants to learn more about agriculture? I think expanding my knowledge base would be beneficial in my line of work and considering the area where we live. She immediately agreed and wanted to know when I could join them. I told her tomorrow and she sounded pleased. Cal, this is great. All of us in agriculture, especially in animal husbandry are in a constant fight against the vegans and the vegetarians for all the misinformation they spout about how animals are utilized for food production. You might be a great spokesperson for the industry. While I doubted I could be a spokesperson I knew I could slant any future design work to fight misinformation. Since it was getting dark I decided to start out for the rural community where the dairy was. I could drive all night if necessary. 
That proved to be a little optimistic. About three in the morning I was close to Raynardville, my destination, but I was dozing off at times. Thankfully there was little traffic. I finally pulled into a store parking lot and moved over to the passenger seat and reclined it. A jacket became my blanket and I was soon asleep. For the second night in a row I was homeless and not able to find a bed to lay my weary body on. At least I wouldn't wake up with soaked clothes. Shortly after daybreak I woke stiff and sore. I got out and walked around the parking lot and then made my way to a diner for some breakfast and then headed on out to the dairy. Jim had liked my work on his logo and probably wore flossy on his shirts but he doubted I could become an effective member of his team. So I worked hard and asked thousands of questions as I had no previous agriculture experience to help me out. Over the next weeks and then a couple of months I learned first how to clean the stalls, then worked my way up to using a small payloader to load the dried manure into the self-propelled manure spreader. Then it was off to the fields to spread the manure as organic fertilizer. Sometimes it had to be augmented by other fertilizer. I helped clean the sewage system that transported the urine to the lagoon. The lagoon was crusted over and I was admonished multiple times to not fall over the handrail as the bacteria in the crust could be fatal if I got any into a wound or my mouth. I was working my way up to where I would also perform the actual milking and then maybe learn how to process the milk before the tank truck arrives to transport to the plant. During that time I heard from Jim a couple of times. The first time was to be notified of a court hearing about the partnership agreement. Somehow the copy that Tony's attorney had in his possession did not have the final page with the IP Freely signature and the entire revised agreement was missing except for the signature page. In our response to the filing, a full copy of the agreement was attached for the judge's examination before the hearing. It should be a hoot. The second contact from Jim was concerning Connie. She was selling the condo and wanted me to agree. I let Jerry handle it as he had my POA already. I didn't care what she did. I assumed she was moving in with Tony. Jerry did pass along a request for me to contact her. I just didn't know why she hadn't started divorce proceedings yet but I certainly wasn't going to initiate contact with her. Then I got a text message from Jennifer White. She was getting fed up with Tony and wasn't alone in her displeasure. According to her Tony had become a nasty autocrat after my jumping ship. Work was suffering and clients were not pleased with the output. I was sorry about that as the people Tony had available were very good and quite capable of doing very good work. Sometimes displeasure with the boss carries over into work production. She also texted me that my replacement was someone I knew very intimately. Tony had brought Connie in as a partner and head designer. That was actually a little funny. Connie had the education but really didn't have the design flair or imagination needed. She also had no supervisory experience. A couple of days later Jennifer texted and wanted to know when I was going to open a new shop. The entire team was ready to walk without notice. She felt that Connie and Tony were almost deliberately trying to make the team's lives so miserable that they might contact me and try to get me back. Her quote was, Tony walks around all day saying, if only Cal was here there would not be a problem. She also said that Connie was just sitting alone and less in the office with Tony as no one wanted to talk with her. The entire crew had figured out the relationship between the two and all were not pleased. Jennifer did not try to get me to come back. Then came the time for the hearing about the partnership. Jerry informed me that I had to attend. Even though the judge would probably hold in my favor, if I did not show up he might hold that against me. I made sure my goatee was nicely groomed. My hair was pretty shaggy by then as I seemed to be too busy to get to a barber but, what the hell, why bother with my hair when I wear a cap all day? I was living in the bunkhouse at the dairy so my suit had a definite bovine air about it even though I did take a shower that morning. Since the hearing was at 9 in the morning I left the dairy at 4 to make the 4 hour drive and give me a little wiggle room. My suit was a little rumpled by the time we got into the courtroom. Connie and Tony were seated with Tony's attorney. Connie looked a little, how shall I put it, like she might be pregnant. It had been a few months since I left and she had just a little paunch going. I wondered who they got to be the sperm donor. Yeah, I am sure she was going to state it was mine. Too bad, unless she divorced me I didn't have to support her whelp. Tony just looked pissed. 
I decided to enter alongside my attorney with a smile as a counterpoint. I might look like a hasty, but that didn't mean I couldn't be happy. I gave them both a short look as we sat down but then faced the judge from that point on. The hearing went pretty much as we expected. The judge first admonished her attorney. For even coming up with such a piss-poor agreement. Then the judge gave them both a chance to withdraw the petition or face perjury charges. Tony's attorney couldn't agree any faster if you shot him out of a cannon. I imagine he only filed at her insistence. The Lord only knows what she thought she was going to get out of it. Maybe she thought she could speak to me and tell me how much of an ass I am. After the ruling Jerry and I stood to make our way out. Connie jumped in front of us. Stop, Cal, I need to speak with you. I am pregnant and you are the father. When are you going to come home? I didn't respond. She went a little haywire and grabbed my stinky lapels. Please, I am your wife and I have rights. You have to talk with me. I need you here beside me. Come home and let's hash this out. I twisted her hands just enough to make her release me. The bailiff was watching very closely. You have no right to speak to me. None whatsoever. By the way you sold our home so there is no home to go to talk. Get a lawyer and file for divorce then maybe I will have to talk to you. I would think you would be in a hurry to marry your skank. By the way, make her pay for your offspring. I don't know why you believe I am the father. You will have to prove it to me. She tried to grab me again. I looked over at the bailiff. Doesn't this constitute battery? Or is it assault or false imprisonment? I do not want this woman to touch me at any time. He hurried over and led Connie away. The whole time Tony was just standing there. She finally spoke. I can't imagine why you are so mean to treat the woman who loves you this way. What kind of man are you? I am the kind of man who doesn't share. I am the kind of man who refuses to forgive sin against him when there are no guilt feelings by the sinners. I am the kind of man who finally has the blinders off and see bitches for what they are. Skanks and whores all of them who betray others. I am also the kind of man who doesn't want to ever talk to anyone who has done him wrong again in this lifetime. I strode out of the courtroom, went straight to my car and headed back to the only home I had left, a place where the cows and most of the people didn't judge. Nancy and Jim Bell had become kind of surrogate parents or, at least, kindly aunt and uncle since I had come to work for them. I had explained why I was on the lam, so to speak, and why I didn't want to do any design work for the near future. They understood but didn't fully agree with me. I guess Nancy really wanted me to be that spokesperson for the industry. I'd be lying if I didn't admit that I still kept a sketch pad next to my bed. The rooms were small in the bunkhouse but there was some privacy. Quite a few nights I was either up late with ideas running around my head or waking at odd hours to doodle a little. Yes, the ideas were coming on a campaign for the dairy industry featuring Flossie. Nancy and Jim needed someone else to be the point person, someone with name recognition. That person also needed to be camera friendly. That certainly was not me. I let it slip one day that I had some ideas about supporting the dairy industry and Nancy almost jumped across the table. What do you have? When can I see it? You have to let us in. I smiled at her. Soon. I am developing the concepts so that you can take them to whomever you wish. The dairy board or the beef board might be the place to start, as it can be tailored to any particular animal. Heck, you could even substitute a chicken or a pig and get the same message out. Right now it features Flossie. When it is fully storyboarded out an ad agency can take it and make it real. They would find the right celebrity voice for the narration and the right look for the model. I won't copyright it so there will be nothing to stop you from using the whole design how you wish. She hugged me until I reminded her that I had a paying job to get back to. She grinned and slapped me on the back. Like your boss is going to fire you. Okay, get to work and get that project done too. Jerry finally received paperwork concerning a separation agreement. Connie was asking for a lot of child support. I said no and he sent the papers back and signed. Next came the divorce papers and now she was asking for even more money in marital counseling. 
Jim countered with her relationship with Tony and that I was not admitting to parentage. A DNA request was made. The judge put the whole thing on hold until the baby was born. Potential child support was reduced due to my low wages. I wasn't making much more than minimum wage at my dairy job. I did get room and board that was not part of my earning statement so it didn't appear on any paperwork for the divorce. Anyhow, I finished the storyboard and gave all of my ideas to the Bells. They were on the dairy board and made their presentation and it was unanimously accepted. Money was soon allocated. Some of my drawings of Flossie were going to be used as a model in a CGI animation. They found a country star, who grew up on a dairy, to be the voice of Flossie and was very in tune with the trials of fighting the vegan crowd. Another celebrity with a deep country drawl was chosen for the narration of other pieces. Then came the ultimate surprise. They chose a former model, now heavily pregnant, to be the focus of this and future ads. Yep. Constance Reynolds Sanders was to be the face of the dairy industry. Nancy explained that they were going to get many pictures and video clips of her now as a pregnant woman using dairy products to help develop her fetus. After the baby was born there would be ads made to show the benefit of dairy products in the development of the child. Nancy knew the possibility of the baby being mine but that wasn't stopping their plans. If Constance's baby wasn't right for the role they would do a search for an appropriate baby star that might grow into a child model if needed. The Bells didn't hesitate to tell anyone who asked where the campaign came from even though I had not copyrighted the material or asked for compensation. A check for $10,000 was delivered one day by my bosses from the dairy board and the other meat boards sent their representatives to talk with me on how to adapt my ideas to their needs. Soon I needed an office as the small bedroom at the dairy was far too small for conducting business and sleeping in. The bells came through again for me. There was an old small commercial building in Raynardville that had been empty for a long time. I don't really want to say how long but the first thing I had to do was replace some small windows and have the resident birds and vermin removed before I could even start to clean. The bells wisely told me I no longer had a job with them unless my new project didn't work out. They did this with a smile and a comment about how I needed to get back to what I did best. I registered the name Agri Design Solutions and got with a banker and an accountant to set up the appropriate bank accounts and get the proper business tax numbers applied for. The $10,000 check was deposited in the new account. My burner phone number was listed as the business number for now. I also arranged to get internet access quickly so I could respond to the other meat boards by email or text as necessary. Early one morning I had my dingy clothes on as I was needing to do a deep cleaning of my new office space. Luckily it also had a small apartment in the back that I was intending on living in for the near future. I was surprised when I unlocked the door and the space was not only gleaming from the cleaning fairies but there was mismatched office furniture filling the old showroom space. It looked like at least 10 people could comfortably work and there was also space left over for a conference slash meeting space. I was completely speechless as I stepped back outside and realized that there was also new paint on the front window announcing that this was the home of Agri Design Solutions. I went back in and headed to the apartment space. I figured I would need to spend the whole day there cleaning but again I was amazed at the transformation. It was cleaned and used, but very sturdy, furniture was filling the space. I also had some visitors. Nancy and Jim were standing there with huge grins on their faces. They quickly introduced me to the mayor and the head of the area chamber of commerce who had arranged the cleaning and furnishing of the space. As the mayor put it, we are in a dying town. Any new business needs every bit of support that we can give. The head of the chamber of commerce echoed that statement and handed me a list. These are area farmers and ranchers who want to talk with you as soon as possible. They have seen how the bells are branding themselves and want to join the ranks. He pointed at one name in particular. This lady is on the board for the soybean advocacy and wants to discuss how to market their soybeans better. Even though the vegans are for soybeans the average person has a negative perception based on that. I was humbled and overwhelmed. I thank you all but I am just one man. I don't know if I can accommodate all this very quickly. I also thank you for furnishing the space to appear that multiple people work here but I don't think that is feasible right now. I have apparently just opened the business. Nancy took over. I don't think you will have any trouble concerning help because I have been in contact with one of your old co-workers. 
You remember Jennifer, don't you? I nodded. Well, Zapiro is apparently in deep trouble. The last payroll bounced and the entire staff walked out. According to Jen, without your leadership and inspiration the whole place fell apart. This was also why we got Constance to come on board. She saw the writing on the wall and got out. Unfortunately she is maintaining her personal relationship with, what's her name, oh yes, Tony but she doesn't work there eh? Nay more. She took a breath as I internalized this news then she continued. Anyhow, to make a long story short, once I told her that you were starting a new design company she wanted to know how to get on board. She and a few others will be here tomorrow. The rest of your old team are working on either moving here, even in RVs if that is necessary, or working remotely via Zoom. I needed to sit down. Thankfully the dining chair was sturdy as I collapsed into it. I couldn't find my voice as I tried to line up every comment and concern I had. It was one thing to start a new business as a sole proprietor and sole employee but having multiple employees, some of whom are moving a considerable distance, on the first day of business was very daunting. How do I proceed? I voiced my concern. Nancy waved a hand at me as though that was not worthy of discussion. I have a person in mind to help you get up and running. She will be here later if you wish to talk with her. The others must have known about this person as all nodded their agreement. I nodded my permission. The mayor quickly made a phone call. I guess I need to take some kind of command. Everyone chuckled as I continued. Do we have any coffee here? I think we all need a cup and then retire to the nice meeting area I saw in the front where we can all sit and relax as we go through all that you have accomplished. I am used to life in a small city but I was unprepared for what happened next. The mayor's phone call brought a huge group of people into my new business office. Coffee, tea, lemonade were soon on a desk while coffee cakes and Danish pastries of every kind were on another desk. People kept coming and going throughout the morning, all with the same welcoming message. Names were dropped. A couple I recognized from the list I had glanced at of potential clients. Most of them told me that they wanted to talk business when I was ready. Finally the mayor, Tom Blevins, brought over someone specific to meet me. Cal, this is my daughter, Emily Toklin. She is very well qualified to help manage your business and has just moved from Detroit back here to live. I believe she can be the person you need. Once again I was speechless for a couple of moments. You remember Constance, my wife? She is a beautiful woman who made a career as a model. Emily puts Connie to shame. I wished for my sketch pad as I had to capture the essence that was this true vision of loveliness. And, as I started to speak with her, she had no clue of what a vision she was. She was the most down-to-earth and organized person I had ever met. We sat amongst the throng of well-wishers and had a deep conversation of how and where I intended this company to go and grow. She immediately came up with a list of items needed to be accomplished to get us truly up and running. As we talked I felt right at home with her. We also discussed my marital status and why it occurred and she informed me that she had just dumped her husband when he came home and announced that he wanted to move to a larger home where he could bring his two girlfriends in to live with them all. He wanted her to call these other women sister wives and that they would all share and share alike. Emily was not in agreement and moved out the next day and came back to Raynardville. Her divorce had recently been finalized. She had two small children that she had to look out for but her mother would help with childcare so she could concentrate on angry design solutions. We agreed to wait until later to discuss wages as the rest of the town's population was still wishing us well. The next day Jennifer and three others showed up for work. We didn't have full internet access yet, those cable guys seemed to take forever to install equipment and get the place wired up, but we could use a tablet to Zoom meet with the others. One of my main goals was to get to know the new and potential clients better than just a quick meeting. Immersing myself in the dairy business had helped to inspire the ad campaign. I proposed that we do the same with each and every client. The designer assigned to that client would go to work in that field until the business was very well understood. Then would come the design for that company. There was some reluctance but when I trotted out my ideas for the dairy board and how it was the springboard for this new company all had to admit my idea had some merit. As we went on it would soon become apparent who was and was not on board with my direction. 
I introduced Emily as the office manager and how her job would evolve as we went on. I admitted freely that I was not a businessman and she had the background to keep us from tanking if we just cooperated with her. Emily then took over the meeting and worked on how timesheets would be kept and submitted along with expense reports. The lists of potential clients, starting with the other meat boards, were dispersed and teams were set up to see how and if my original idea would work or whether we would start fresh and come up with exciting and dynamic campaigns for each entity. It didn't take long for our new teams to get busy. At least one member of each team went incognito to learn as quickly as possible about that industry. Because of that we had new and exciting insights to each genre and that reflected in the proposed campaigns. The beef and pork boards each gave $10,000 retainers to make sure their campaigns were a top priority. That gave us a little breathing space for wages and other expenses. We also quickly set up some of the smaller local businesses and farms with logos and that brought in a few dollars to help. I knew it was inevitable as I could no longer keep my location somewhat a secret so I wasn't surprised when the little bell over the front door rang one morning and my soon-to-be ex-wife made her presence known. One of her commercials had started to air so I assumed she would now be a celebrity and expect special treatment. I was surprised when she didn't act like a diva but just asked if she could see me. Emily came out to intercede as I was in the conference area with a new client and madly sketching some ideas. She had already learned that I needed to focus on the job at hand while she took care of the running of the business. At the beginning of the day we would meet and discuss how we thought the day would go. At the end of the day we would meet again to critique and work on solutions. I guess the conversation started out with, Hello, I am Emily. I am the business manager. How may I help you? I would like to speak with Cal, please. I am sorry but he is busy with a client at the moment. Did you have an appointment? Emily told me later that Constance gave a rueful smile at that question. No, I hoped that if I just stopped in that he would speak with me. I believe he would never give me an appointment to see him. I am sorry but I am a little confused. Why would he refuse to see you? I am his wife. Oh, that explains a lot. Please have a seat. Do you need an extra pad to sit on? This was due to Constance's advanced pregnancy. I guess Emily knew from experience that the old tailbone sometimes gets tender as the fetus gets bigger. Emily stayed close to see if Constance needed anything. She got her a glass of water and some coffee cake. A few of the older church ladies were so impressed with our new company that they provided pastries or coffee cake daily for us. I was contemplating setting up a gym so that we all would not turn into couch potatoes. Constance and Emily made some small talk. I was so engrossed with my client that I didn't know she was there for quite a while. I suppose Cal has told you about our relationship woes. Emily responded, Cal and I exchanged marital stories that first day we met while discussing how I might help him with the business. Since then there has been no comment, not even when we saw the commercial for the dairy industry. She paused. He did seem pleased with your portrayal of a soon-to-be mother using his ideas to promote the industry. I was actually trying to impress him. His ideas are very good and should help paint a more realistic picture to the consumer. Do you know how he got all of his inspiration? He seems to know the industry ins and outs very well. Emily was quick to smile. I gather he went to work for a local dairy after leaving his last employer. He mucked stalls, cleaned milkers, dumped manure and then spread it on the fields. I think that might account for some of his background. Also, his former employers are good friends and come and see him every time they come to town. They have extensive experience in the field and would answer any question posed to them. Constance seemed surprised that I had done manual labor as described. She had always known me as an artist and a graphic designer. She looked around. Is there only Cal and you working here? I see a bunch of empty desks. How is the business doing? Emily gave out another smile. Are you asking for yourself or for your lover? I understand that she has closed her business and is working as an entry-level designer for her old company. Do you want him to succeed here or are you hoping he goes the way of her? By the way, what is her name? I guess Constance blushed a little. I am curious because I want him to succeed. 
He walked out, actually ran away as I was trying to reassure him that I loved him in spite of appearances. I never wanted to hurt him. I just fell in love with someone else, someone I felt a love as deep as I have for Cal. He just would not stop to try and understand and accept. She stopped to see how Emily was accepting her comment. By the way her name is Tony. And how is your relationship these days? Are you still getting along like newlyweds? I guess Constance's face became flushed then. We are having some problems. With Cal gone there is a little contention between us. The pregnancy hasn't helped as we were planned. Ning on having a few years to explore our relationship before I got pregnant but Cal's sperm was too potent. He overcame my birth control and now we are going to have a daughter. We, as in you and Tony, or we, as in you and Cal? Actually, in an ideal world it would be Cal, Tony and me having a baby and we would love her like she should be loved by three parents. I guess Emily started to laugh then. I heard her and looked over and saw whom she was talking with. I tried to not let the fact she was there interfere with my clients as they didn't deserve the drama that was going to unfold in a few minutes. I couldn't hear what Emily told Constance but I could see the facial expressions. It portended to be a contentious reunion. Like I said I did not hear their conversation. It had to be related to me later but Emily responded to Constance's outrageous comment about how all three of us should be the parents of her soon-to-be born girl. You know you are almost as delusional as my ex-husband. He wanted me to be part of a harem and his sluts would have equal say in how our children would be raised. I left him so fast his head is still spinning. I haven't known Cal all that long but I know he would never agree to your ideal life. How long were you married to him? Do you know him at all? I believe that is when the conversation ended. I could hear my lovely wife from where I sat. I think that's enough from you. Tell my husband I am here and need to speak to him. I thought she was going to stamp her foot like a child who has been told she can't have a piece of candy. Her look was thunderous. I don't think the spike in her blood pressure was healthy in her pregnant condition but what do I know? I ignored her. I had clients to work with at the moment. If she didn't like it she could make an appointment like everyone else had to. I turned back to my clients. They raised cemental beef and wanted their brand to show it. I was proposing a profile of one of their bulls with their brand on it and the name of the ranch in the middle of the side of the beef. I made sure that the profile was actually one of their bulls so that it was authentic and not just some clip art. When I had a good rendition done on the sketchpad we agreed on that concept. We rose and I shook their hands and promised to have them a color example on the computer in a few days. They would then make their final decision. After they left I took a deep breath and let it out slowly. It was time for the final confrontation. Thankfully Tony had not accompanied Constance to Raynardville. I went over to the chair where Constance was residing. I didn't greet her as I certainly didn't want to see her. Constance, why are you here? I told you to do all our conversing through our attorneys. The divorce is on hold just until you deliver then the determination of parentage will be done and I will pay you child support if it is proven to be mine. It's actually a she, Cal. She will be a beautiful baby. Don't you want to hold your own daughter? Not as long as you or Tony have any say in how she is to be raised. I don't believe you are a good enough role model to raise any child and, after the way that Tony and you sandbagged me, I don't believe she should be around any child at any time. The Lord only knows what kind of ethics and morals you two will teach her. I see nothing but destruction in her future. That's why you need to come home, Cal. You could teach her and show her ethics in action. You could be the one person who could put her on the right path. Yeah, I would be her nanny and caregiver while you and Tony flaunt your loose morals and lack of ethics in front of her every day. Sorry but no thanks. You will just abandon your child? So you say. I promise you that I have had no other man since we became exclusive. Yeah, I know how good your promises are. You promised once to forsake all others and now you can't live without your newest love in your life. We will just have to wait and see if you have had any other man other than me. You know that isn't true. I would never cheat on you. I had to laugh. What do you call having lesbian sex with my boss? 
If that isn't cheating then what is? But I love her and she loves me, that can't be cheating if you are having sex with someone you love. I shook my head. She was delusional, pure, and simple. You can't argue with someone that delusional. It might make you crazy. I don't think we have anything more to discuss. You need to leave. If you don't then I will have you removed for trespassing. I will not knowingly see you again. From now on send your comments through my attorney. I will have him pass them on to me. I do not promise to reply. But your daughter will be born soon. We need you back at home, both Tony and I and your daughter. I want you in the delivery room with me when she is born. Will Tony be there also? Of course, she will be Jenny's second mom and she is my birthing coach. She has to be there. If there is one person I want to see less than you then it is my former boss. No, I won't be there. Have the DNA test done as soon as possible and I will provide my sample without quarrel or delay. If she is a product of my sperm then I will pay the child support set by the courts. I will warn you that I am not making very much as the business is still new and just starting to show a profit. Hell, I was not even allowed any input on the baby's name. It had already been decided by the two sluts. I didn't voice that complaint as she would probably inform me that amongst the massive amount of unread messages was probably something about the baby's name. I didn't want to give her the satisfaction of pointing that little fact out to me. I led her to the door. I really wanted to grab her arm and force her out but it would not look good to anyone who might see me push her out the door. I opened it and she dutifully stepped out. Constance, I am not kidding when I said I would have you removed for trespassing. You have no need of my services in any way, shape, or form except for possible child support. Do not come back here and do not try to contact me directly ever again. That goes for your resident slut also. Have a safe trip home, not that I care about you but your unborn child needs to be safe. I closed the door on her reply and locked it. I hoped the sound of the lock snapping shut would give her the message that I meant business. After a few minutes I unlocked the door as we had appointments to keep. A week later Jerry called and informed me that I was the proud father of a 7-pound 8-ounce baby girl with blonde hair, 10 fingers and 10 toes, and blue eyes. Again I wondered as to the paternal parentage as both Constance and I have dark hair and brown eyes. I had already submitted my DNA to a lab and had the results sent to Jerry. There could not be any way for the two to fake my results to match little Jenny's this way. Once Constance had the DNA results from then baby's test then any competent doctor could compare the results and determine whether she was from my loins. I would like to say that Emily and I were becoming romantically involved but it was far too soon to be saying that. We were getting along famously. Occasionally she would have to bring her little ones to work when her mother had a conflict. We put in a bench with storage in the conference area so they could keep some toys there to play with. If there happened to be a client meeting then Emily would take the kids into the apartment and they would play in the living room area while Emily answered any call using a cordless phone. With some of the staff working remotely and still living in my old small city, we were handling clients in both communities and the intervening area. Billables were on the upswing. Immersing ourselves in the various business interests was also bearing fruit. We could point out some of the less-known details of the industry targeted to help educate the public while selling the concept. The weeks passed. Finally Jerry got the divorce on the docket. The results of the DNA test were conclusive that I was in fact Jenny's biological father. I was prepared to provide the ordered child support and had been sending a check each month to Constance once Jerry had confirmed parentage. It was the day of the hearing. Constance was asking for marriage counseling. Jerry got Constance on the stand first and forced her to relate the whole lesbian affair and how they had hidden it from me. Then he called Tony to the stand and forced her to admit how she had been giving me updates on the affair as it unfolded while keeping Constance's name secret. Jerry then made each of them admit that they had tried to make me virtually a slave with the partnership agreement and had, in fact, finally admitted to the affair after believing I had signed the agreement. Jerry sat down after tearing them apart on the stand and whispered, Do you want primary custody of the baby? I didn't know what to say. It had never occurred to me that I might prevail over the mother of the child. Why do you ask, was my only reply at the moment as I tried to make a quick decision. 
Look at the judge, said Jerry. That man is pissed. If he could charge them with a criminal offense for what they did to you he would. Right now is the perfect time to ask this. Shared custody is a given at the least. The judge did have a sour face as he listened to the opposing attorney try to minimize the damage the two women had to admit to. I nodded to Jerry. This baby needs something better than those two. Go for it. When it was his turn Jerry stood and addressed the judge. Your Honor. Due to the admission by my client's wife and her lover as to how they attempted to manipulate him into agreeing to their unusual living arrangement proposal and also since this was an unplanned pregnancy that both women have testified to as being a bone of contention be too. And them, my client is now amending his divorce petition to include full custody of his daughter, Jenny Sanders. He is willing to grant liberal visitation to the baby's mother, Constance Sanders, but requests that the other party to this disaster of a marriage, Ms. Tony Lapiro, be denied any contact with the baby. That one exploded like a grenade. All three, the attorney, Constance and Tony, jumped up and started explaining, complaining and yelling at once. It was quite the din for a few moments as the judge pounded his gavel for quiet. They shut up but remained standing. The baby was in her carrier and slept through the outburst. After a quick whispered conversation the attorney spoke. Your Honor, Mr. Sanders does not care about the child. He has resisted and ignored all communications concerning the pregnancy and subsequent childbirth of his own child. He refused to have anything to do with Mrs. Sanders during the difficult stages of the pregnancy and the childbirth. As a matter of fact he has not seen the child until this hearing and has not even held his child. We do not believe that he should be granted anything more than supervised visitation. Constance gave me a frightened look before suddenly standing. Your Honor, I wish to be heard. Her attorney was frantically trying to get her to be quiet and sit down but the judge censored the attorney and allowed Constance to speak. Please speak, Mrs. Sanders. I will warn you that you are trying my patience here and are treading on very thin ice. She nodded. I am sorry for the confusion, Your Honor, but I do not support supervised supervision by the baby's father. If I had my way he could move home today and become the good parent I know he is capable of being. He is the innocent one here. I am not ashamed of my lifestyle choices but I do apologize for how Tony and I developed our relationship and our poor attempt to lead Cal into accepting it. The way we went about it harmed him more than we had anticipated. The judge gave her attorney a hard stare when the idiot tried to object to his own client's testimony and wrapped the piece of wood with his gavel to emphasize his distaste. Then, pray tell, Mrs. Sanders why did you file for divorce? You cited abandonment and callous disregard for your feelings in your brief. Did your husband make threats against you or Ms. Lapiro? Did he make you feel unsafe in your home? Did he strike you or do anything to hurt you in the eyes of your family or friends? Your Honor, I filed for divorce based on recommendations by both my attorney and Ms. Lapiro. We had not been able to get Cal to respond to any of our attempts at communication so that we might resolve some of the issues that Cal has. We hoped this would force him into counseling and give us that opportunity to make him understand he is loved and cherished by me and by Tony. The pregnancy was unintended and certainly unplanned but, if it helps him to heal, then it will be an additional point in my attempt to stay married while still having a relationship with Tony. As far as any threats to me or Tony, he has not made any except to have either of us removed from his new place of business for trespassing. Your husband's attorney alludes to the pregnancy as being a point of contention between you and your lover. Is this true? Since it was not a planned pregnancy it has taken some time to come to grips with. We had not planned on having a child for a couple of years yet. But, like other parents who had to quickly adjust to the news of a baby, we have accepted my daughter and are working toward being the parents she needs for us to be. Are you talking about yourself and Mr. Sanders or you and Ms. Lapiro? At the moment I am talking about me and Ms. Lapiro. I hope that Cal will accept the requested visitation rights so that he can be part of her upbringing if he can't accept our relationship and move home. I whispered to my attorney, ask her about her home, where she is living and so forth. Also, why did she sell the condo when I was helping to make the payments? I think the judge was reading my mind or at least my lips. Mrs. Sanders, where are you currently residing? I live with Tony in her apartment. Did you and your husband have a separate place to live in while you were cohabitating? 
Yes, sir, we had a condominium that we lived in. What happened to that piece of real estate? I sold it after Cal left. Why? Could you not afford it after he moved out? Was it too much of a financial burden on you? She actually blushed. It was a little more of a burden as Cal's income dropped significantly but he did send money to our bank every month. I decided to sell so that Tony and I could set up household together as we do love each other very much. Did you make a profit from the sale of the home? Yes, sir, Cal and I had lived there for seven years so it had some equity built up. Did you share that equity with your husband? She faltered a little and became red from embarrassment. No, Tony's business was failing and I had come in as a partner. We used every bit of money we could get to try and keep the business from going broke. It didn't work and the business failed anyhow. Tony now works for another company. He looked over the paperwork in front of him. I don't see a partnership agreement in these papers. Did you have a formalized contract? No, sir, Tony and I had a gentleman's agreement. She promised I would recover what I put into the company when it became profitable again. Did your husband have any knowledge of the use of his money in this venture? She shook her head. Did you attempt to tell your husband what you were going to do with the money from the sale of your shared domicile? She shook her head again. So, in other words, you conspired to have an illicit affair with your husband's boss, who flaunted your affair to him while hiding your identity, then came up with this abomination of a partnership agreement to force him into approving your intended change in your marriage. Then, after he left, you sold the shared real estate to invest in the same woman without a contract while hiding the arrangement from your husband and not giving him any input as to how the money was being used. Then you and his former boss attempt to hold him to the agreement you thought he signed, while committing fraud when bringing it to trial. Now you want him to just say, all's well and move home, excuse me, to your lover's home and become what, an unpaid nanny? This while you flaunt your relationship with Ms. Lapiro? Your Honor, Cal would not be an unpaid nanny. He would be welcomed with open arms by me as a full-fledged partner in our relationship. I want him with me where he belongs. I think that I have heard enough. I will take all of this under advisement and will inform you of my decision a week from today in this courtroom and at the same time as we began these proceedings. He banged his gavel and left the chambers as we all stood silently. I shook Jerry's hand and hustled out of the courtroom. I was trying to get out ahead of any attempt of Constance and Tony to waylay me. Constance was trying to pick up the baby and yelled at me, asking if I wanted to see my daughter. I hardened my heart and kept moving even though I seemed to be wading through molasses to get out of there. Jerry prevented Tony from chasing me down by just blocking the aisle. The crap she was yelling made me realize she had never been a friend, just someone to use, abuse, and then try to control for her own ends. I stayed that week in a motel. Agri Design Solutions was already finding success in that niche that Tony had carved out with Sapiro and now needed an office here in my old hometown. Each day I met with representatives of the Chamber of Commerce and various realtors looking for suitable space to hang my and my colleagues' hats. Of course they showed me the old Sapiro headquarters as it was designed for this type of business. The landlord's representative was a little confused when I refused to even enter the door and walked away telling him to find me something else. There were multiple reasons for not renting that space and one of them was that someone would assume that Zapiro had reopened with a new name. Sorry, we were a new and unique business and didn't need that old baggage to drag us down. And, yes, there were too many bad memories of that office space to allow me to use it. Finally I settled on an old retail space, kind of like what I had in Reinardville. It had some parking, not a lot, but was in an area that would get our name out there just from the street traffic. I called all of my local employees to come and check the place over. We soon had a plan for decor, including murals on the walls and special curtains for the large front windows highlighting some of our work. It is amazing what you can get these days. I also ordered some of the same kind of curtains for the Reinardville office. When it came time for the final hearing I had a new suit and tie to wear. I still had the goatee but my hair was nicely cut as fitting my role as a businessman. I had picked up the habit of wearing a hat so I came into the courtroom carrying a fedora. Jerry and I sat and lowly spoke as we waited for the judge. Constance was alone with her attorney. 
I guessed that Tony was babysitting or had moved the baby to an undisclosed location in case the judge ruled in my favor. Constance looked sad and forlorn. What I didn't know was that an emergency order had been made by the judge to the Children's Protective Services Unit and there had been a site visit to Constance in Tony's home. To Constance it appeared that she was going to lose her daughter. What she didn't know was that CPS had also been to Agri Design Solutions in Reinardville and had run afoul of Emily and the ladies of the community. When told that I was being investigated as a possible home for Jenny the Inter. A female population of Reinardville had stepped forward and claimed to be potential child carers as needed. I had not told anyone about the possibility of becoming the custodial parent as I was still reeling from the possibility. Emily apparently took it in stride and soon had the second bedroom fully fitted out with furniture and accessories to bring a baby safely into the apartment. I did get an earful for not letting Emily know about the turn of events at the hearing. She made me smile as she gave me hell. When she told me how the ladies of the town had come to the rescue I vowed to never leave Reinardville to live even if our satellite office ultimately did more business than the Rebnardville area. It was humbling and heartwarming to be accepted that fast into a community. Anyhow, on to the hearing. The judge called us all to order. He was solemn as he gave us his ruling. As you both now know I asked for an immediate investigation by the Department of Health and Human Services, Child Protective Division into both of you. I needed to see which parent would be more likely to give this child the best environment to thrive and grow. Ideally it would be the two of you in a traditional living arrangement but that is not what is in the cards here. He paused and cleared his throat. The preliminary report I have here does not say that the father, Calvin Sanders, or the mother, Constance Reynolds Sanders, would either be a better environment for this child to thrive. Now that HHS is involved there will be further site visits and investigations to assure that whatever is decided today will be in the best interest of the child. Constance looked relieved. I suppose she had felt her lesbian relationship might have swayed an investigator my way. I was a little relieved myself. Taking on the role of a full-time father to a baby only a few months old was very daunting. We waited with bated breath for his final pronouncement. I have reservations about keeping this child in her present situation because of the chicanery, out-and-out -out lying and attempted manipulation of Mr. Sanders into a place where he would be nothing more than a slave to two women who definitely did not have his best interests in mind. The lies that have been told and admitted to in this courtroom make my stomach churn. If I could find a violation of a law somewhere in this fiasco of a marriage and breakup I would already have the district attorney filing charges against you, Mrs. Reynolds Sanders, and Ms. Tony Lapiro. I find you despicable and wonder about what priority you will place your daughter in your life. I also have reservations about Ms. Lapiro's influence on the child when she shows no remorse of how she pursued and seduced you and destroyed Mr. Sanders' happy home. I see she is not here to support you today. Why is that Ms. Reynolds? Constance's attorney quickly conferred with his client. Your Honor, Ms. Lapiro is providing care of the child today as it was believed that emotions might run very high and disturb the baby. The judge gave kind of a harumph. That's the only commendable thing you have done recently, madam. I also have reservations about giving custody to a man who has not shown any interest in his child other than paying the recommended child support since her birth. You pointed out last week that Mr. Sanders has not attempted to visit the child or even hold her. This lack of attachment is troubling even though I have glowing reports and recommendations from the townspeople of Reinardville. I could only nod as the same concerns were in my thoughts. Even with the help of the people in my newly adopted hometown was I good enough to be a parent to Jenny? He turned his attention fully to me. Is there any way you could move back here and still run your business? I understand you are opening an office here. Constance jerked her head around when she heard that. No, your honor, there is no reason to move back here. As you might know this is not my hometown. I grew up a thousand miles from here and only came here for the education. I stayed because of the business opportunities locally and then the chance to open a graphic design office with Ms. Lapiro. I have never felt more at home anywhere than Reinardville. The entire community has not only accepted me but has shown tremendous support, not only in my fledgling business but in this matter. I have been humbled and overwhelmed by their acceptance and support. I cannot in good conscience leave there. He nodded. 
At this time I grant the dissolution of the marriage of Calvin Sanders and Constance Reynolds Sanders. I also order further investigation by the Department of Health and Human Services as to the well-being of the child, Jenny Sanders Lapiro. For the near future the standard visitation by the father, Calvin Sanders, will be limited to one day a week and every other weekend. At the child's age of six months then custody will be shared with the child being with Mr. Sanders one week out of every three weeks. At the end of the first year of life I will revisit the visitation and custody issue when I am leaning on shared custody of two weeks with Mr. Sanders and then two weeks with Ms. Reynolds Sanders from then on. I also am issuing the order that the child's name will be changed from Sanders Lapiro to Sanders. I was floored. I had not heard that Constance had legally made Jenny's name Sanders Lapiro. Another insult thrown in my face. I could feel the rage starting to build. Courtroom or no courtroom I was about to unload on my wayward ex-wife. I think she could feel it from where she sat as she shrank against her attorney for protection. I barely heard the rest from the judge. I am also ordering that Tony Lapiro not be alone with the child at any time. She will not be a caregiver to this child. If the investigation by HHS shows that she is in any way showing influence over the well-being of the child then I will order the child be removed from your household and immediately be placed in the care of Mr. Sanders with him being sole custodial parent. He stared at Constance. Do you understand? Constance looked confused. Sir, we live together. Why can't Tony have any contact with our daughter? My ruling is based on not only the history of how she proceeded to seduce you and drive your husband out of your life, but also on an investigation done at my behest. I found that your husband was the driving force of the Ms. Lapiro's business that failed. Once he left it was a foregone conclusion that it would fail, despite the money you put into it. It is evident that Ms. Lapiro is not the businesswoman that she thinks she is. The partnership agreement that she attempted to foist on him that would make him the ultimate cuckold and almost a slave to her also enters into this ruling. Also, I find it troubling that you gave so much money to her to try and save that business without any kind of repayment schedule or contract. The fact that you didn't even try to either share the money from the sale of the condominium with your husband or get his input into the disposition or investing of the money. I am concerned as to whether you have the best interest of your child in mind when it comes to your lover. I understand that you are gaining some fame as a spokesperson for the dairy industry and that your daughter is playing a significant part in that." Constance nodded. My investigator has uncovered a plot by Ms. Lapiro and your attorney to trademark your daughter's name and likeness and become her agent and profit from this fame now and into the future. His gaze spoke volumes. Jerry Caldwell was almost quivering with the need to jump up and state something in my favor. I was completely bewildered at this turn of events. The rage was turning from Constance and towards Tony. How could someone who had been such a good friend be involved in something so dastardly? The judge was focused on Constance and wasn't paying attention to us at all. Were you aware of this? Constance looked as bewildered as I was. She looked at her attorney. He couldn't return the gaze and looked away. She shook her head. I am sorry, Your Honor but I was under the assumption that Jenny was being represented by my agent. The contracts were signed by me, not Tony. I have no idea what her plan was or why she was doing this. The judge nodded. As to your living arrangements I cannot rule where or with whom you live. I can only rule that Ms. Lapiro have no unsupervised contact with your daughter. He turned to me. Mr. Sanders, I also cannot demand that you use this opportunity to get to know and then build a relationship with your daughter but I will pass on to HHS that I will recommend placement of Jenny Sanders into the foster care system if you do not develop a familial relationship with her in case of the need to remove her from your ex-wife's domicile. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor, I do and I will work to start visitation as soon as possible. He nodded and hit his gavel on the block to signal the end of the hearing. Jerry turned to me and grinned. You are now single, at least in 60 days, and free as a bird. Congratulations. I nodded and gave him a half smile. Only the attorneys benefit from this kind of thing. I was still hurting and angry. I wanted nothing more than to crush Tony with my bare hands. This from a guy who had never had to defend himself physically. I certainly had never been in the army or had been spec ops. 
I didn't do martial arts and didn't even know any badasses that would do my bidding if needed. But I was still wanting to feel my hands around someone's neck until the life was squeezed out of her. Jerry was standing in the aisle when the judge beckoned the opposing attorney forward for a quiet word. We could still hear it, though. Son, I want you to know that I am forwarding everything from this disaster to the Bar Association. Expect to hear from the Bar soon and be ready. To surrender your license. The attorney looked properly chastised and just nodded his head. When he turned around Constance was in his face. How can you call yourself my representative? How can you do this to me? Are you trying to steal my daughter from me? She didn't let him answer before giving him a slap to the face and turning to me. Cal, wait, please. I beg you to listen to me. I stopped. I was going to have to deal with her for as long as we shared our daughter so I might as well start to accept that little fact. I didn't have to speak to her though. She could just talk at me. Jerry stopped with me and nodded. Please forgive me. I had no idea what Tony was doing and is in the process of trying to do. I don't understand it at all. I will comply with the judge's ruling even if it means moving out on my own again. I will not deny you any time you wish to see Jenny. As a matter of fact I want you to come to the condo and meet her now, today, if you will. I can't bear the thought of losing her and I also can't stand the thought that her father is not in her life. Please come and get to know her. She tentatively touched my sleeve as though she wanted to grab me and drag me with her. I just played statue, I didn't even pull away. Her expression fell some more and she sighed as she pulled away. I had hoped that, with you getting to know Jenny, you would forgive me and maybe even let me return to you in some way. I still love you. With a dispassionate look I shrugged my shoulders. She got the message and backed away. Jerry stepped in. Ms. Reynolds, why don't we agree on a neutral place so that Cal and Jenny can meet? I will speak for Cal when I say that Ms. Lapira was not welcome at any such meeting and should not attempt any contact at this time. Constance nodded and then wiped a few tears away as she realized how she had been addressed. Part of my filing had insisted on her returning to her maiden name. Now the name Sanders would not be used by her or Tony if they got married. They then worked out a time in the afternoon at a local park where I could see my daughter. As I write this last part one wish I could say that everything turned out sunshine and roses. Just like in real life it was far more complicated than that. Jenny was very resistant to me. She cried every time I tried to pick her up until she was about three months old. She finally became used to me. The visitation went as planned. After she was six months old Constance weaned her from her breast milk so that there would not be any problem with being able to feed my daughter when she was with me. I had to abandon my plan to use the small apartment at the business. The nice people at Child Protective Services of HHS barely approved the apartment for the odd times I would have her there. Once the every week out of three staying with me kicked in I needed a better and bigger abode. Once again the citizens of Reinardville stepped up and found me a very nice home for Jenny and me. Constance did move out of Tony's place but I guess they got together every time Jenny was with me and the odd night when Constance could arrange a sitter. She did make sure that Tony had absolutely no contact with Jenny. Jenny remained the baby in the commercials for the dairy board in Constance and I made sure that the money paid to her account was invested for her future education and then for her adult life. I made sure to pay the child support needed when Jenny was with Constance and banked the same amount in that trust account when she was with me. Did I get together with Emily? Oh, that would have been some great sex but no, it didn't happen that way. Emily decided that a relationship with the boss wasn't kosher so she looked elsewhere. I found my next love in a most unassuming way. During the time that I could only have Jenny on alternate weekends I would make the four-hour drive back to where Constance and I had lived. I rented a small apartment so there would be an address for the surprise visits by the CPS investigator. I figured the strain of long driving would make Jenny more resistant to getting to know me so I would take off early so I could visit with my staff there. The business was taking off so I also needed to find an office manager there. Into my life came a little spitfire named Karen. She was barely 5 feet tall and maybe a 100 pounds soaking wet. She wasn't a beauty like Constance or Emily but she was girl next door pretty. She applied for the office manager position and interviewed well. 
I just wondered if she could keep my local bunch of designers focused and productive. I gave her a chance and she took the reins and worked with Emily to get everyone doing even better than they had ever done before. Karen was my age and was also from a broken marriage. Her husband got his secretary pregnant and moved out on Karen leaving her with two small kids. The first time I met the little tykes they immediately started calling me Uncle Cal. We danced around each other for quite a while. I didn't want to be accused of sexual harassment so I made sure that every encounter with her was circumspect until one Thursday I was visiting the office. I had caught up with all the local business and was preparing to occupy my usual desk so I could focus on my own work when Karen approached me. Now, my usual routine was to come down on Friday, catch up and make any executive decisions needed, not that there were many since I had Emily and Karen, and then work on my own projects. I might be the boss but I was also the lead designer and had to pull my weight. This week I had come down on Thursday to confer with Jerry Caldwell about incorporating and was prepared to work until my appointment. Karen came over and tried to plop her tiny behind on the corner of my desk but she wasn't quite tall enough. She gave a little hop and managed to catch the corner and wiggle until she was comfortable. She then ruined my workday but changed my life. Look, I know you won't make the first move because of the current rules about quid pro quo so I will make the first move. I think that you are interested in me and I am certainly interested in you. If it would help us along I will tender my resignation so you will feel more comfortable in dating me. I hope that isn't necessary but there it is. How about dining at my place tonight? Now I might be a little naive, think about what Constance and Tony had done behind my back, but I hope I am not stupid. A very nice looking woman who knows her mind and has no trouble speaking it was asking me out. I immediately agreed to the date at her house. We progressed from there. Finally Emily and Karen came to me and proposed that they switch locations. Karen wanted to be with me all the time and Emily was ready to date again and wanted to be located in a larger location where the pickings would be bigger. It was kind of ironic when she decided on one of my designers. Karen moved to Reynardville but directly into my house. We married a couple of months later and her kids just started calling me Cal instead of Uncle Cal. I didn't try to replace their dad as he was not a deadbeat father, just stupid in having an affair and complicating his life. When Jenny was too Tony tried to take control of her future again. I don't know what her angle was but the court was quick to make me the custodial parent and give Constance liberal visitation. Constance finally broke off with Tony when Tony showed up pregnant. It appeared that Tony was not the dedicated lesbian that Constance needed. She told me once it was the cheating, not the cock, that killed their relationship. I couldn't help myself as I replied, I fully understand. She got a hurt look on her face when she realized the irony in my comment. Constance moved closer so she could see Jenny more often. She is still making commercials and using Jenny. They are good faces for the dairy industry. My business is growing. We are taking on larger projects in some nearby larger communities. I suppose I will soon have to create another satellite office. Too bad Tony had to go off the rails, it could have been her success. Oh, you want to know more about Tony? Well, she quite working out during her pregnancy and gained about 50 pounds that never came off. Her boyfriend turned out to be married and a co-worker. She made such a fuss when he refused to acknowledge the pregnancy that both were fired. Tony ended up on welfare and Medicaid while looking for another job. Her son was born prematurely because of Tony becoming eclamptic and later was diagnosed with autism. He is getting special care to enhance every bit of his natural abilities but he has a long hard road ahead of him. Tony reportedly now has an even harder time attracting any male or female into a relationship. And, yes, I am happy. My life is going well, thank you for asking.